Thank you for staying with us. Now, the chairman of the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, Professor Mahmoud Yakubu, has advised the staff of the commission to remain nonpartisan and maintain their integrity ahead of the Bayelsa, Imo, and Kogi partnership elections. He emphasized this during a visit to some INEC offices to assess preparations for the off-cycle gubernatorial elections slated for November the 11th. He said INEC is not a political party and does not have a candidate in the coming election. He also called on the electoral officers to ensure that all registration area centers were fully activated early enough to enable smooth conduct of the election. Well, joining us in the studio is Executive Secretary Heda, Heda Resources Center and Convener Election Integrity Monitoring Group, Suleiman Arigbabu. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> now, let's dig into the off-cycle elections. Mm -hmm. In fact, beginning with this statement coming from uh, the uh, commissioner, uh, the chairman of the Independent Commission of INEC, talking about integrity. Uh, this matter of uh, INEC's integrity, you know, was challenged in the just concluded yeah. general election with yeah. uh, the various litigations we have seen, the various contestation mm -hmm. as regards mm -hmm. transmission of results and all of it. How critical or expedient is it for INEC to begin to hammer on this? Can yeah. its reputation be restored? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, the statement by the INEC chairman is critical. It's crucial at this time that he... Uh, because the most damage that INEC has suffered has been from officials of INEC who unfortunately um, did not live by the book. So we saw in a number of places where officials went out, out, outside of ethics, outside of the law, to either favor some candidates or do some other things. Um, I am not one of those who believe that oh, the outcome of the general election damaged INEC's um, uh, reputation in, in the proper sense of it because uh, when you do look at it, the 2023 general election has thrown up more upset in our electoral history than we can ever imagine. And um, of course, the biggest challenge INEC had was the issue of um, their IREF, uh, the result not being uploaded to IREF. I think that has been given too much um, space in the integrity discourse about the last election. I think INEC did pretty well in that election, uh, but it's embarrassing when you find situations where uh, officials of INEC descend into the arena in some places, and uh, it's mess and it's difficult if you have. It's just the same thing that happens with the police. No matter how upright an IG of police is, as long as you have a federal police, somebody is going to mount a roadblock somewhere in one back street that the IG cannot see, and the embarrassment is going to go to the whole force. Uh, so that's why some of us think that eventually what Nigeria must strive to have is an electoral system that would not be this overly centralized. And that is because of the over-centralization that you're having issues of, oh, logistic problem, it's difficult to, uh, they didn't deploy on time to certain places and all of that. And that's why you have the humongous amount of money that is required for us to conduct election. We must get to that state where elections can be handled by local authorities based on criteria that have been agreed upon, knowing that every agency that's supposed to contribute to the success of that election will do the right thing, whether they are security agencies, whether providers of services like logistics, whatever it is, people must play their part. And if they don't, because it's only INEC that comes under the train, that is thrown under the bus when mm. some things do go wrong. The other providers of services who do not live up to the bid should also be held accountable. And that way we'll start to see people knowing that such national assignment as elections should not be undermined for any reasons, as um, we often see. And, and talking about um, enshrining the integrity of the system, I just want to take you back to the, your earlier point, you know, where you opined that um, perhaps the issue of IREV, you know, may have, you know, been overstressed. But 
it was one of the you know many things we celebrated about the new electoral act you mm -hmm. know first it was beavers and the you know f the wonders of beavers and then with irev mm -hmm. but we saw that irev didn't deliver as it yeah. should attributed to glitches that yeah. INEC you know mentioned yeah. and the supreme court also said in that judgment uh, involving uh, the president and uh, his his rivals where he said that the irev functioning yeah. according to the promises of INEC was to enforce the sanctity of the system. So in terms of expectations, you yeah. know, really as to, uh, you know, IREV, I, I just want you to, you know, clarify your earlier statement. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, I mean, I was one of those who came out earlier in the elections to say that let's be clear about what, irrespective of what Mahmoud um, um, Yakub have said, wherever, whatever promises, the law remains the law. What is the essence of the IREV? We know the essence of the beavers. Without beavers accreditation, you can't be accredited, uh, accredited. Now, what is the essence of the IRF? The essence of the IRF is to further strengthen the integrity of the process because the more people perceive, the more transparency they see, the more they believe that oh, things went on well. But the IRF is not our collation tool. We have a means of collation which is physical. You take the various forms ECAT, you take to the various um, stages of collation. That is the primary collation. Now, what IREV is meant to do is that if there is any controversy, if there's any contention, then IREV will be one of those tools that will reach out to. Okay, so IREV then failed, unfortunately. And unfortunately enough, INEC has not explained to us what exactly they meant by glitches. We are not happy that that happened. But not to take away from the beauty of the election itself, anybody who had a contention with results still has the primary way of proving that this result does not tally with what was published at the polling unit or at the various other collation centers. So we should not forget that primarily IREV is, is like um, enhancing or beautifying something that already has its form and exists. Mm. So the fact that that IREV did not work on that day will not and cannot be said that, oh, the election has failed. Because some people have condemned that the election has failed. Mm -hmm. It is only if we're able to show that, oh, eventually the results with which INEC now arrived at, oh, the governor of this state, the senator here, the rep here, or the president is not correct, does not tally with what they have, that is when we can say that, oh, there's a big problem, you know, with the election. So I am not saying that IREV, uh, we know that in the off-cycle elections before the, General, um, election. general election. These things worked. Yeah. We expect INEC to tell us what exactly they mean by these glitches. I am not one of those who think that that couldn't have been glitches. I mean, I have I have transactions in banks since February that still not been resolved oh. because of one glitch. So Nigeria kind of forgot that we have issues with some of these technology. These technologies, trust issues, you know. perhaps. <laughs> and of course, we have trust issues. Right. Yes. We need to quickly go on a commercial break. When we return, we'll continue this conversation. Stay with us. Thank you for staying with us. We are still looking at uh, off-cycle elections coming in, coming up in uh, on Saturday in Imo, Bayelsa, and Kogi states. And we still have our guests in the st our guests in the studio, Sulaiman Ariguagbu. Uh, he is Executive Secretary, Head of Resources Center, and Convener Election Integrity Monitoring Group. And before we went on the break, you were talking about the technical glitches that uh, we witnessed during the election, especially with regards to IREV. But now, INEC is saying that they are 90% ready. They have addressed every glitch, uh, <clears throat> technical glitch, so to speak. And uh, that's always good to go. But oftentimes what we see is that despite they coming out to speak about they being ready, what happens on the field does not really tally with whatever preparation they had. Mm -hmm. Perhaps the question is, what can INEC do differently this time around to restore confidence and trust? So each time we went on um, off-cycle elections, INEC performance is actually upped. Mm -hmm. And of course, except in situations where some officials, and you have, this is our country, and it happens everywhere in the world. You have corrupt policemen, you have corrupt government officials. So sometimes, I, and especially in a situation where INEC has to hire ad hoc people, and some of them are even staff of INEC anyway, who undermine the integrity of the election. Because outside of that, you see that INEC's preparation is good until the D day. And the first problem you encounter is logistical. They do not deploy to polling units on time. 
Now, this happened, especially, in, we are going to see a bit of that in this election. You are talking, for instance, about Bielsa, where you have riverine communities. You have equally riverine communities in uh, Kogi, even though most part of Kogi is accessible by road. But INEC relies on third parties, on service providers, to provide some of these services. So uh, some of them are compromised. Some will talk about, if I don't see money, I'm not going to move. Mm. Some will, it is on the day. It happens to us, you hire a vehicle to travel. It's on the day of that travel that the man will say, well, I went to fix my brick yesterday, and it's acting mm -hmm. up today. Mm -hmm. So a lot of things do happen. And then the next thing um, that usually happens outside of that logistical problem is that, OK, when INEC has done all its preparation, security agencies who are supposed to, so if you look at our elections, we have all security, whether carrying arms or not, all of them will be there. The military will be in the outer perimeter. The police will be the active on the road parading. Uh, but at the, at the polling unit itself, there will be nobody carrying firearm. Mm -hmm. Now, the boys who are going to come and disrupt elections, will carry some form of weapon. So the most you have, the, it's a policeman or a road safety person who will say, uh, you know, it's not good. I mean, we are saying that the least that the IG could do is to at least equip these police people, either with a spy camera, a body camera, that can capture what happened, so that at the end of the day, we can have evidence to prosecute. Mm. Or the policeman can be bold enough to put a camera in front of whoever is doing whatever. That one will first deter, because when people know that there will be consequences, They'll be careful about what they do. It will first deter, and if it does not deter you, it will help the society to get at you. Mm. So, but security agencies do not live up to this bid often. So this is, these are the things that happen, and people say, oh, INEC. We seem to focus too much on INEC. And again, when people violate electoral rules, when they commit crime on election days, we still wait for INEC to go and do. INEC has always said that we don't have the manpower, we don't have to do all this post-election uh, prosecution, have an electoral offenses commission mm -hmm. that will do this thing. So we are overburdening INEC, in my own opinion. Mm -hmm. And I also think that having a, an overly centralized INEC should be something we are going to win ourselves. In the next 20 years, I don't think we should have a central INEC. Well, the Senate was looking or uh, mousing that recently, that they are looking at perhaps unbundling INEC decentralizing it, although they didn't specify what they were. So what they what want they to meant. do is unbundling, so take off some responsibility away off from them, but still at central level. So there will be a body that registers political parties, there will be a body that, but still central. Mm. If you look at some, let's take for instance the United States, it's local authorities that conduct the election. Mm. I'm not saying we are near there now, because this is a situation where in every state, every state, irrespective of the party in control, when you conduct local government election by the states here, the party must, SMAV for Kaduna and Rufai, the party will take 100, we not take some. Mm. So, I mean, it's obvious we all know what happens in, 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 under this kind of situation. So we cannot now give our national elections to them because, but that is where we should strive to get to. What do we need to do such that we don't have one body in Abuja looking at election in one river night community, you know, in Bayelsa? Mm. All right, so, but what is it looking like for you? Because the issue of security, INEC has spoken severally on the issue. Uh, the security uh, forces, security agencies are also speaking about already show of force is, um, is happening in, in this state. But there is concern about, you know, voter turnout. Uh, and two chief reasons, um, confidence in INEC and security. Mm -hmm. Let's look at Imo State, for example. Now, what are, what are you reading? Because indices are saying that, um, you know, the, the, the numbers might even drop. It might even yeah. dip further in terms yeah. of uh, people mm -hmm. coming out. Yeah, so the reality for Imo especially is that it's just like somebody goes to the hospital for a small ailment, but they say there is, there is an underlying ailment, like we saw during COVID. So there is the underlying ailment of um, the insurgency, the unknown government, that's a big problem before the election, mm. which is a deterrent for people from coming out. It's a disincentive. Now you have a situation where they also know that when you have security agencies outside, these unknown gunmen who have declared all sorts of things in the southeast will look for their soft spots to have attacked them. And of course, where they come to attack them, civilians could also be victims of such attacks. So I, I see a situation where people will be quite reluctant 
you know, to come. And, but it's going to take a lot, you know, both from the government, the traditional rulers, uh, the security agencies, and INEC itself to... I, I do not see much of a voter turnout in Imo, especially. Yeah. And it's not only limited to Imo. There is there are crisis also in Bielsa, in Kobe. Imo has its own peculiar because of the Southeast uh, situation that we have. You know, so there's going to be some voter apathy added to the fact that people do not trust the electoral system. And even where they do, even in other clients where they seem to trust the electoral system, especially in the American, what have you, voter turnout is usually less than 50 or just there about mm -hmm. percent. But in a country like us where we need a leadership recruitment process to be all inclusive, to produce the kind of leaders that we require, we expect that people will turn out more. But disappointment over time, you know, and the fact that they know that people who get to do things, um, who gets to violate the law, who gets to, uh, you know, wreak violence on people, don't get punished at the end of the day. So um, I see it affecting voter turnout, really. Okay, let's quickly go on another break. When we return, we'll continue this conversation. Stay with us. Thank you for staying with us. We're, st we're still looking at the off-cycle elections in Imo, uh, Kogi, and Bayosa State. And we still have our guest in the studio. Before we went to the break, we were talking about the matter of uh, voter apathy uh, based as a result of um, insecurity, so to speak. And we recall that uh, INEC had mentioned earlier, sometime uh, weeks ago, that uh, the situation across some of the states that have been tugged has been volatile over the years when it comes to election is quite concerning. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, they, the question is perhaps how can INEC approach this election now, uh, knowing that these states have their peculiarities, so to speak, such that it would encourage the turnout of voters? So the, the journey to the kind of country we want is going to, is going to be a journey. It's not, uh, it's not going to be a sprint. So there is no tapping the finger and having the lights on, the way mm. things are. Things are pretty dark. Uh, because you see all sorts of other things affecting already the result of the election that we are going into. Um, so let's see what INEC has done. It has um, met with the Interagency Consultative um, Committee on Election Security, uh, the Chief of Army Staff, I mean, the Chief of Defense Staff, and all the other. Um, um, chiefs were there, the IG himself and all of that. Um, they keep assuring people that um, they are fully mobilized. The IG was on TV yesterday saying they are fully mobilized, they have learned from previous elections. Of course, one thing that is going on well for them is that these are off-cycle elections, mm -hmm. meaning that they can deploy much more Mm. You know, to these places. On the papers, you see 67,000 policemen for Kogi and Bayosa. Yeah, yeah. Uh, of course, nobody ends up probing those figures, but mm. we want to believe that they will be there. But it's not just about, it's not just about the number, it's about the strategic deployment, mm. and then it's about what are they allowed to do. So if you have 60, if you have 1,000 police in a place where they do not carry anything, any firearm or what have you, um, ten boys from the creeks can, you know, dis dislodge them. That's a fact. Uh, it is my hope that someday we will need to deploy the military or even the police for our elections. But let's face the reality of where we are at now. Mm -hmm. 
we need security presence to assure some people. Even though we know that even the coming out of security um, is a Could form of deja vu. Could also have an yeah, you know, to, it's yeah. mi the, A militarized environment, yeah. some people would rather stay off entirely. Mm -hmm. If you have so many military or police, it means that there is likelihood of danger. So some people would rather stay off. We know that that has its adverse effect. But we equally do not want a situation that where those who brave it to come out are then also still assaulted or maimed or killed. Uh, so what the security have been doing, what INEC has been doing is to reassure us is the most they can do for now. And then we need to see the deployment on ground. And we need to see that they are following all their own rules that they have set. The remaining is left to prayer and to Nigerians, you mm -hmm. know, <laughs> because the reality is that it's going to take a while for people to trust the system. And what happens during the election and post the election counts. There will be people who foment trouble. Are we able to capture the fact? Are we able to bring them to justice? If that does not happen, we'll continue this vicious cycle for, for, for very long time. Well, the papers this morning, the military police are vowing to take tough actions for ballot box snatchers. It? And it's not only ballot box snatchers, really. There are people who also prevent people from coming out of And that's why it's not just the election day. It's also about things that happen before the election. It's about things that people are saying. So I can threaten you and make you not come out. I don't need to, to snatch ballot box. So there are so many, uh, the police, you know, the military is being deployed for this special operation. This is a special operation for the police. But this is not really special operation for police because police ought to have been part of this process all along. Monitoring what people are saying, you know, in the public space. Monitoring what people are doing. There are already violence happening in some of these places. Mm. So what has the police been doing? It is how the police is able to respond to some of these things that will reassure people that indeed there is um, some semblance of being in control by the security uh, agencies. We also saw, in terms of if we can also uh, imbibe some lessons or more lessons from the last the general election, uh, the issue of issue-based campaigns, you know, mm. how, how well we saw them entrenched, you know, mm. at the elections and mm. what you are seeing on ground in these states. Mm. Um, how big of a concern is this for you? So, I mean, there's always been the appeal, you know, to the political class, especially to the political parties, that um, campaigns should be issue-based. And uh, it's not just the political, it's also us, the electorates. They come to our communities, they bring all sorts of things. We have issues that we worry about, and we do not present these issues. Or our voices are drowned in the noise of supporters and what have you. So if we can have more constructive engagement, if political parties and political candidates know that people will ask tough questions before the elections, and know that when the elections are done and winners emerge, people will still remind them they would start taking us seriously. Many campaign rallies that you go, it's just more or less like Jamboree. There's a lot of music, there's a lot of um, branding of uh, branded shirts and face cap, and then they start to throw all sort of things around. People catch them, they make all sort of noise. The candidates barely, have, other people come and speak for the candidates, and maybe the candidates' hand will just be raised up. There's, there's no engagement. And I think the worrisome trend or the implication is the, the, the thin line between these campaigns and, you know, insecurity uh, implications. Because, you know, that, that is, in Bielsa, that narrative is also being driven. Mm -hmm. And in Imo as, as well as in Kogi, you know, how we can have clean, fair um, output of campaign which will not descend into chaos and the likes. Yes, so that's, that's a big responsibility for political parties. They are supposed to take these things more serious. And beyond that, post-election analysis, we are often stuck with, oh, who won? What did the court say? This and that. But we don't interrogate the conduct of people post the election and during the election. These are things that public needs to interrogate. So how did you campaign? What were the issues you raised? You know, uh, And what are the issues that matter to us? So you have various groups. We have women group coming up with or their own manifesto. You have farmers group coming up with farmers manifesto for politicians. How much do they engage these things? And how much do they engage the issues? A lot of that do not happen as of yet because our elections largely is still found fair and jamboree. Uh, politicians do not attach the kind of serious business atmosphere they are supposed to attach to it. Uh, the serious business they attach is the violence part of it. So their rhetorics and all the kind of things they say do not often 
help to raise proper issues, do not engage citizens. So, but for us, as citizens, for us as civil society organizations, as observers of elections, we are not only to monitor what they say, but after the elections, we are supposed to now say, okay, during the elections, this was your, can we even rate parties in terms of their engagement with um, voters, in terms of voter education exercise that they do? Can we rate candidates in terms of how much they engage issues? And give them a score, beside, be, beyond INEX own scorecard of who won or who did not win. Mm. Can we give the process a scorecard of, oh, INEX, this is how you perform. You, party A, this is how you perform. You, candidate, this is how engaging you were. This is how you responded to people's, you know, um, engagement, interactions, and interrogations. Some of these things need to come. These people, one, will be getting the feedback as to how we see them and perceive them. And so citizens also will be seeing that their engagement, their inter interrogation of these political parties really do matter to them because that scorecard will be determined. It's like adding points to them. You know, somebody may lose an election, but know that they have built a lot of awareness in citizens, among observers, among civil society organizations, among the media, in such a way that they are graded as, oh, well, this person was very engaging. This person showed a lot of society. They may not have won the election, but they are a good material for next opportunity. I believe they election. get that across social media, across everywhere. They will get yeah. such information yeah. and they'll be able to see how much value they brought yes. to, to the campaign. So uh, what would that change if you bring a scorecard? I, I, it's also, uh, I'm happy that you mentioned social media because this is also to guide us as citizens on how we engage in the public space, how we engage, especially on social media. We don't face the real things. There are a lot of fake news and rumors and what have you. But when we look at things like this, because this is not going to be conducted by INEC, this is going to be conducted by the civil media, society. by civil society. Mm -hmm. You know, look at issues dispassionately. We are not politicians. And if we say that, oh, this person responded more to this kind of questions, or this party has a better thing for this kind of issues, the evidence will be there. We don't need to, I mean, if it's video evidence, if it's a re a newspaper reportage of their engagement, it will be there. You know, and gradually we are going to start changing the mentality of the electorate that they can raise issues and those issues will count in the discourse during political right. um, cycles. Mm. Another matter is the matter of uh, peace accords. We, mm. we, we, <laughs> see, we see them, political parties, because we're looking at responsibility of political parties now. We see them sign peace accords towards these elections, yeah. but then... There are those who believe that because it is not a legally binding document, mm -hmm. there's not much seen with regards to bringing people to account mm -hmm. even after signing this accord. Yeah, yeah really, I'm reflecting on this peace accord, I, I think it's a bit, um, well, yes, you can say accepting where we are at as a people, but I think it's a bit um, insulting to us as people, you know. Signing peace accord, so what does that mean? Even sometimes they will bring... Uh, American this one foreign things to come and witness peace accord between presidential. What does it really mean? We don't need peace accord. What we need is enforcement of our laws. What we need is for our police to be upright, to, to, to be brave, to do what it ought to do. What we need are system, infrastructure that will help us capture evidence for the courts. The court is not going to uh, decide on what, who is shouting more on social media or what is that. The court is going to de decide issues based on evidence. So if I say there's violence, I will bring evidence of violence. At least I know that somebody is going to jail. If one part of society's problem is being kept in jail, reducing the tension in society. So peace accord, it doesn't really work for us. It does, the violence still happens. People often don't get sentenced or you know, penalized for the violence that happened. And of course, like, it doesn't have the force of law. You know, it's just like, I mean, maybe we should just tell all of them, if you're a Muslim candidate, the Friday before the election, go to mosque. If you're a Christian candidate, the Sunday before the election, go and hear the preaching, because it's preaching. All the peace accord they are doing, it's just preaching. They, and these people hear enough preaching. They just choose which one to adhere to and which one not to adhere to. And you to. put pen to paper. Mm. They put pen to paper, but it doesn't amount to much. Mm. Doesn't amount, the most they will do is to insulate themselves. Uh, yes, uh, yesterday, the, politi the head of political parties were saying, we have told our people, focus on the issues, uh, don't do violence. They are insulating themselves. But we know that the real instructions of what will happen, as we, they, will, they may not even get to know. The, those who are on the ground already, they have positioned the boys. People invest more 
in guns during this election than in voter education. Mm. And that's the reality. So you go to most of these places, by the time they shoot gun twice, everybody scatter and you know, or you don't you don't need to snatch back a lot, but just make sure that in your opponent's stronghold, fire a couple of shots and then the people will not vote. And you have depleted his votes. It's, you know, it happens. So the peace accord really for me is largely ceremonial. It has no, we have never interrogated it after the peace accord. What did you as a governorship candidate do to reduce the incidence of violence? It's never been interrogated and it's not going to be because it doesn't hold any force of law. So perhaps maybe a, home, a homegrown solution because ideally a peace bond, you know, should be binding. Mm -hmm. but, but perhaps uh, maybe there, there is a way that we can hold political parties to account. If, mm -hmm. if, if you as a political party chairman, you're saying you've told your followers, you've told your candidates, you know, to be, um, to be abiding, law abiding and to run uh, issue-based campaigns. But, you know, on election day, we are seeing people say either you vote for this party or, 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 or not, or, or that kind of narrative, you know, instilling fear and, and panic. Uh, in addition to your thoughts on enforcing the law, if we can also, you know, put this um, this call out yeah. and beyond calling out, you know, mm. uh, doing the needful prosecuting yeah. and otherwise. I, I agree with you. And I think that for the peace accord to even make some sense, the day a candidate emerges is the day they should sign peace accord. They are going to sign right. a peace accord in a, Okay, not days to the election. They are going to sign in a, maybe tomorrow. Tomorrow, yeah. tomorrow, tomorrow. Wednesday. Yeah. Okay, all the, all the eight speeches inciting and all of that has happened at the campaign rallies so already some people have died already as we speak so then few days to the so it means that one piece only on election day mm. the real <coughs> violence is wrought on people's psyche weeks ahead of the election you know the threats and all of that happens before the election so what you just find on the election they are just a little more adjustment to the evil that has been wrought earlier than you know, before the election. So I, I, I think that it is largely ceremony. I think what we need is that we should have better means of policing our society, gathering intelligence, gathering evidence of people. Uh, if we cannot deter them, at least gather evidence to prosecute and bring people to book. That is what we need. When people know that they will be brought to consequences, book, there will be consequences. Right. They will, they will another, think another thing is activists are, you know, in the worst election setting, you know, activists are there. Mm -hmm. But are we harnessing the value uh, electoral of officers, or observers, I should say, are we, are we harnessing their value well enough? Uh, can they be used somehow, you know, to fill in the void? Uh, you, to you, gather this or, intelligence or, or, because they are scattered this, across. Yes, yeah. and provide, because yeah. I was about to suggest that perhaps we should also enable the Peace Commission, mm -hmm. or you know, if we can enable them. Okay, so you've mandated parties to come and sign an, ac an accord. Mm -hmm. On election day, where are you? Go and go, monitor Go, go and monitor. Yeah. So uh, yeah. what about that? Yeah, so I mean, it, it's beautiful. Right now, I next stipulate what the role of... Um, election observers are yeah, just meant to be there to observe, not to see anything, uh, whatever it is. So observers go with caution. When we train observers, uh, we tell them your life, your safety is the most oh. paramount. Mm -hmm. just like so the there are places you go to, you bring out your phone even to call. You could get a resounding slap from nowhere. So there are places you go to. But, but if we want to make this something that we do as a nation, that want to monitor, want to gather evidence. Observers are there, they can help. Um, there are organizations that actually monitor violence on election day. Mm -hmm. And they do that, and yeah. they come up with reports. None of the people who went to court called them you know, to use that report. We're only using the report of oh, who won, who did not. So we already civil society are trying. We could do a lot more. But it has to be supported. You were talking about a peace commission. If you have a peace commission, because INEC, I mean, INEC started from giving us jackets and bags. Now the most you get from INEC is uh, maybe just one small ID card, you know. Because INEC is also challenged with money. Mm. You know, Budgets. election costs a lot. Mm. So if you have a peace commission, for instance, that engage your observer, train them on how they can, you know, capture evidence. What kind of evidence do you want to capture? Mm. You need to know what you are looking at for a few two people, husband and wife are arguing at the polling center. That's <laughs> not what you are there for. Mm. You know, so training, investment in um, local observer missions, it will help. I agree. It will help.
Mm. In interesting. Uh, let's look at, uh, because I was seeing on the front page of the papers this morning, and uh, one of the story is that um, no election in 38 polling units out of Imo's uh, 4,000, over 4,000 uh, polling units because of zero registration. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what does that say of our voter education? Because you mentioned it in passing earlier, and I needed to bring it back mm -hmm. for us to speak yeah. about. So some of these things are happening because of um, insecurity, insecurity right. displacement. Yeah. And that's why I say we cannot run away from the bigger reality. Uh, often we expect INEC to do magic, but it has to operate within our bigger reality. So, so that is one. And then secondly, I mean, these are pre-existing um, polling units. So it's not like maybe just newly created, mm -hmm. you know. So um, again, how do we build confidence again in the electorate? Mm -hmm. How do we assure them that we will protect them? Mm -hmm. You know, if we don't achieve that, uh, 38 is small for now. Mm -hmm. A lot will happen. The implication if you look on, at our it, elect on our democracy is critical. Yeah. Because the election process or electoral yeah. process mm -hmm. is part of what makes a democracy. Sure. So I would want you to touch on that. Yeah, I, I, I was going to say that if you look at the rate of collection of PVC, which INEC has published, um, um, so uh, IMO has about um, 2.4 million and yeah. 2.3 has collected. 2.3 million. Yeah. Mm. Uh, um, Bayesa has about 1.2 and 1.1 has collected. Wow. Kogi has 1.9, 1.8 1. 1. Right. has collected. collected. Now, of course, we have not interrogated. These are INEC who, who did the collection. We need to, after the election, we need to interrogate that. So but when you look at that, it appears ah, encouraging. But then, on at the end of the day, day. <laughs> maybe just about 500,000 voters mm. will determine. Far, far less than, you know. So there are, these are issues that affect the quality of our democracy. Um, I can tell you that from 1999 up to now, the only part of our democracy that has had the most improvement is the INEC processes, because there's been a lot of reforms, very painful because you know the people who make the laws are the beneficiaries of the, mm -hmm. uh, of the problems <laughs> in the system. Mm. But reluctantly, but with force, with persistence from people with tenacity, we've been able to get them to at least achieve the kind of reforms. We are not there yet, but we, we, are, we have traveled a far distance and that's good. But it will not amount to anything if after all of these reforms, the voters don't come out. That's it. Because it then means that only few people will determine the fate of the rest of us. And usually, um, part of these few people, you have those who are there because they are incentivized. You know, they are Even given, out of the low numbers. Yes, out of the low numbers. You have, you have many people who are voting for a candidate that they don't even know their first name. They have just been, okay, you have been paid to do this, you are going to do it. You have people who are doing it out of other reasons that we cannot be discussing, you know, on air. So it means that these are the people who determine those who are going to lead us at the various, um, whether it's at state, at local government, or at the national level. So it's, 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 it's injurious to our democracy. It's something we need to fix. But we cannot fix our electoral, ele um, uh, voter apathy. We cannot fix uh, electoral violence and all of that in isolation of the bigger problems of the country. So the same Nigerian police that will help us to ensure security, safety of lives and property during elections, the same Nigerian police that ought to have been doing that long before the election. Mm. If it didn't succeed before the election, it's not likely to succeed on election day. Mm. But the issue oh. of voter turnout, analysts would also say this is governorship. Uh, perhaps it's more closer to the people, and uh, we should also that should also drive the numbers. Do oh. you share that sentiment? Yes, it really, because most, I mean, elections are local. Mm. You, you can have um, a presidential result in, in the state, and it doesn't tell you what comes for the governorship. So, yes, elections are local. It ought to. But when we are talking about insecurity, I don't care who is going to be governor or who is going to be president. If I don't feel secure, I'm not going to go out. Mm. And then if you're also talking about people who think, oh, they have decided what they are going to do anyway, so that's why I say that the number of PVC collection after this election, we need to ask INEC. A very impressive collection, but how did they really do the distribution? You know, um, 
is, is there a room for people to collect on behalf of others, for instance? Mm. You know, because I can collect your PVC to disenfranchise you. You know, all of that needs to be interrogated. Really? I need you to talk to us mm. more about that. Mm. Now, let's perhaps touch on uh, litigations, the role of um, the judiciary you know, in our elections, because that is what even brought us to this point of having off-cycle elections yeah, sure. in, in the first place. Uh, we see uh, people making comments as to, uh, if we even go and vote at the end of the day, it's still mm. the courts that will decide. <laughs> that's also a factor, even if voter yes, turnout. Yes, yes. That, mm -hmm. that is the courts that will still come out to decide. Yeah. Mm. I, I'm looking at implications, really, mm -hmm. for our democracy yeah. and how this is, you know, changing the dynamics mm -hmm as things are. Mm. Okay, so um, we, we, we should not criminalize or mm -hmm. delegitimize the involvement of our courts in our electoral process. Uh, the people who make that happen are those who do not do their duties, starting with the political parties, uh, the candidates, and perhaps the law enforcement agents, and of course, um, INEC to a good extent. So, uh, but at least it's the safest way, is the, is the most reasonable way of you know, adjudicating an electoral dispute. Uh, Self-help will not help us. Right. Mm. Yeah. But when you look at um, some of the things happening at the level of the, especially some pre-election matters, um, it, it's a bit worrisome. So some states, as we speak, we do not know who eventually will be the candidate because some matters will still get to the Supreme Court. <laughs> um, the, one of the candidates, major candidates for Bielsa was just sure. recently Reinstated. Mm -hmm. We know that in Kogi, a major aspirant is mm -hmm. still in court trying to say that I should be the one. So it therefore means that you, you campaign uh, with the face of Mr. A. Uh, of course, we know that the Supreme Court will not give us the kind of road to me and situation anymore. But we are moving closer to something like that. Because you find this, we saw it in, in Zamfara and uh, one other state in the 2019 general election where they lost everything that they gained at the polls mm. because of you know, litigation. Uh, the problem of litigation is because parties lack internal democracy. And mm. we cannot emphasize this enough. If they don't resolve that, if we don't, make, if we don't have political parties that respect the law, that have their own internal democracy, that respect their own law, the law, constitutions that they put for themselves, who continue to have it. The courts are just sitting down there, jejeli. And it is these politicians that bring all their problems and then compound the situation. It's even overwhelming. All right. Yeah, and it's overwhelming for the courts anyway. We have to wrap up this conversation here now. We must thank you, Silaimon Arik Thank you. Uh, Executive Secretary, Heda Resources uh, Resource Center, and Convener Election Integrity Monitoring Group for your time on the program. Thank, thank you very, you very thank much. Thank you for very much. Well, this is where we draw the curtains on the program for today. Let's tell you that the views and reactions of all our resource persons are theirs and have no connection with TVC News. <laughs> <laughs>